Hi, I'm Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science and You. Science, it covers a wide variety of topics. Biology, chemistry, physics, the list goes on. Today we focus on the important role women are playing in science, and we'll celebrate some female scientists who've already had a major impact. We start here in Riverside Park in front of the Women's Protective Health Association Monument, honoring those who were committed to shedding light on women's public health issues. We kick off today's special half hour with a story about a program making a difference for girls today. If they pushed off of something, what would happen? A lesson about gravity on a steamy day, not exactly a typical summer camp. This is goals for girls at the intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum, an all-out effort to get girls learning and loving STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. All day, every day saying, you can, you can. Linda Kennedy, Vice President of Education at the Intrepid Museum, believes in the power of that message. The goal to grow the presence of women in STEM fields by capturing girls' interest early and boosting their confidence to continue. We visited the summer intensive program, six weeks of hands-on learning, free of charge for the 50 accepted students who pass the application process. Every day, they come here all day, every day for six weeks and they're told this is for you, and they're told to fearlessly try it. It's okay to fail, it's okay to try something and it doesn't work, try it again. A little bit more, come on, come on Afatari, stop. Yes, it's science and yes, it's fun. Resistance bands help the girls grasp the effects of gravity. Using the bands simulates how tired your muscles get when you come back from space and how they really do have to have a time of really relearning some things that we take for granted just by living in a gravity environment on Earth. To understand the challenge of fine motor skills for an astronaut, paper clips and thick gloves. That kind of gave them the feel of, oh my God, this is really hard. And yes, training is necessary to become an astronaut. Just what, by picking up a small paper clip with a huge many, glove six? is a feat. Research shows women are still underrepresented when it comes to science and engineering. Consider this from the National Girls Collaborative Project. Women make up half of the total U.S. college-educated workforce, but only 29% of the science and engineering workforce. And female scientists and engineers are concentrated in different occupations than men. For example, only 17.1% of industrial engineers are women, and that drops to 7.9% of mechanical engineers. I just think it's very important and vital for women like at young ages to get into the science field and like think about it and even if you don't want to like go in as a career like at least appreciate science for what it is. The can do will do approach is infused everywhere here including reminders on the walls about how to dress and behave in a professional setting. This is not a one off. The experience extends beyond the six weeks tapping the girls into a network of role models mentors and opportunities. But perhaps the most important lesson the simple promise of possibility. I want to be an electrical engineer or maybe mechanical. I don't think I want to be an engineer because it's more hands-on and like trial and error. So current cancer treatments, there are two major problems. First, it's not specific towards cancer cells, so it kills normal cells in addition to cancer cells. So that has very low patient quality of life. And then the second problem is that although it kills the majority of cancer cells, it doesn't really kill the source of cancer cells. So my nanoparticle can detect cancer cells in the body, eradicate the cancer cells, and then monitor the treatment response. The objective of this project really was just to personalize cancer treatment to make it more effective and how it can overcome a problem that all of society is facing. Same. We're very proud of you. Thank you. Go cure cancer. Thank you. Yeah, I like that. While technology innovation continues to explode, one woman is leading a science revolution, preparing young girls with computer coding skills that could translate into technology careers. Kyung Yoon has the story. I'm Kyung Yoon. There's long been a shortage of female workers in the fields of science and technology. One woman is setting out to change all that. Reshma Sajani is in a hurry to equip girls with computing skills that can help them pursue careers in technology and engineering. We're a national movement and our goal is to close the gender gap in computer science education. In 2012, she launched Girls Who Code to break down gender stereotypes and get more young women excited about computer programming or coding, which is what you need to know to create computer software apps and websites. My name is Sonia and 
I want to create an app that can combine all of the traffic and subway updates. In this effort, she has been at the forefront of leading a science revolution with women in tech to help reverse an alarming trend in this country. While 37 percent of computer science graduates were women in the 1980s, today that number is less than 20 percent. Many of our girls come from families that don't have a computer, that don't have Wi-Fi, and they are sitting there next to girls who may have every opportunity in the world. But both of them are so disadvantaged when it comes to coding education that this experience is transformational for the girls and their families. Her goal is to level the playing field so that women can fill at least half of the estimated 1.4 million computing jobs in the U.S. in 2020. What began four years ago with a program for 20 girls in New York City has rapidly expanded across the country. This summer, the seven-week immersion program for high school girls will be serving more than 1,500 students in 11 cities. It's caught the attention of sponsors like Google, Twitter, and General Electric. We do two things. We embed classrooms in technology companies and universities where for seven weeks we teach girls, rising juniors and seniors in high school, how to computer program. That course is essentially the equivalent of a half a semester in college. And then we build after-school programs in schools, libraries, and community centers. Girls Who Code also works in partnership with larger national initiatives like Google's Made with Code, a $50 million investment by the technology giant to inspire more young women to take an interest in computer science and prepare them for the future workforce. The program goes beyond mere technical training, teaching leadership skills and exposing the students to role models in the world of technology and beyond, including visits from Amazon's Jeff Bezos and Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg. On this day, U.S. Congresswoman Grace Meng came by to meet with the girls and share some of her own experiences. These programs are so important. Uh, had it not been for, for example, internships for myself when I was a student, I never would have thought about entering politics. And so we need to, as leaders in this country, uh, create more opportunities where our young women feel like they can do whatever they set their minds to. They need to see role models that look like themselves and have come from similar backgrounds. Uh, so that they feel that it's possible and gives them the confidence to, to move forward. 11th grader Zuri Harvell says that beyond learning JavaScript and HTML, she has gained the confidence to reach outside her comfort zone and take risks. They inspire me to show that it doesn't matter how many times you fail or how many times you don't get exactly what you want. There's always another way to that path or maybe even something better. We as a society don't encourage women to take risks and to fail, right? That we live in a society that's so ashamed of failure, especially for women, right? Men are constantly getting rejected, constantly, right? Starting companies, closing companies, they didn't work and they raised money and they'd go do it all over again. Whereas we almost feel like we need to be a sure thing, right? Before we take that step. And I, feel, I really felt like that was what was keeping so many women behind. Reshma Sajani knows a thing or two about risk-taking and failure, having run for and lost two high-profile political races in New York, first for U.S. Congress in 2010 and then for New York City public advocate in 2012. It was that experience of really meeting young women on the campaign trail, seeing the inequity in our school system here in New York City is what inspired me to start Girls Who Code. Reshma's goal is to reach one million girls by 2020 and to close the gender gap in computer science education. there were an organization whose sole mission was to enable and encourage female students here in New York City to have careers in technology. Well, look no further. Artina Beth Pina found it. 
Can you imagine being interested in a technology career and having scholarships, internships, and networking opportunities right at your fingertips? Whitney is making that dream a reality. Knowing that I had a scholarship made it a lot easier to say, like, let me just go with it. I kind of feel like this whole class has just been a breath of fresh air. These young women are excited about the Women in Technology and Entrepreneurship in New York program, or Whitney, the partnership between CUNY, Verizon, and Cornell Tech, whose initiative is to increase the number of female undergrad and graduate students studying technology at CUNY. There's four long years uh, from the time uh, that you graduate from high school to when you're ready for the workforce. There was really very little going on to encourage more young women at exactly the time in their life where they're supposed to be exposing themselves to lots of different fields of study. And so if we could expose them to technology, that we could actually get much larger percent of that undergraduate population of women uh, deciding that this was the field they wanted to study. Research has shown that of all the STEM disciplines, technology is the only one where the number of women in the field has gone down. Right now, the national data says that 1% uh, of the undergraduate women are majoring in computer science. 5 to 6% of the undergraduate men are majoring in computer science. If you could move that 1% of women to 5%, you would double the number of workers entering the tech field in the country. In CUNY alone, if we could move the 1% of the undergraduate women to about 3 to 4%, we would be pushing between four and 5,000 women into the tech field in New York. Whitney is giving undergrad and graduate women an incentive to get into the tech field by offering $3,000 annual scholarships at CUNY, as well as paid internships across New York City. I'm doing research with Professor Shiri Azenkot, who works on assistive technology. And the project that I'm working on is about older adults with mobility difficulties and we're trying to understand the factors that they take into consideration while they're navigating in urban environments. Do they avoid narrower streets or big intersections? We're hoping to then um, apply those to something like Google Maps to have navigational tools that are catering towards older adults. What does Whitney mean to you? And it's a very exciting opportunity to be a part of. For me, it's a way to get a feeling for what it would be like if I wanted to go into research. Every Tuesday night, all the interns come together from their various um, internships, and we get to hear from somebody in the field, which is really cool because we get to network with each other, and we get to network with people that we probably wouldn't have met with otherwise. Do you realize how lucky you are? Yeah, <laughs> it's really cool. Renee is not only an intern, but also a Whitney Scholarship recipient who's looking forward to starting grad school this fall and to what the future holds. One of the things that I really found interesting when I got into computer science was that it can be applied to every field. It's hard to think of a profession or a uh, area of interest that isn't being revolutionized by technology. The more women there are, the more women there'll be. Ladies, if you're interested in applying for a scholarship or a paid internship for next summer or fall, log on to the Whitney website for more information. For Science and You, I'm Tina Beth Pena. The first thing we want to show you is um, usually the user can check your status by clicking on the status button. And you can see I'm a little nervous, so <laughs> my heart rate's a little high. We do have a series of checks to ensure that there are no false alarms. Um, and let's say you do not press the check because you actually are in need of help. Uh, it starts issuing a loud audible alert as well. As you'll see in a moment, it's been detected. It's saying a medical emergency has been detected. The next thing that happens is a text message is automatically sent to her cell phone. And at the same time, your medical information is displayed on the screen. So paramedics and anyone else that shows up can see your past history and things like that, which could be helpful in the event of emergency. One of the huge um, advantages of ours is that you don't actually need to press a button to summon help. You know, Because when you need help the most is when you can't get it yourself. The most unique thing about it is it is mobile. Um, you can yeah. take it anywhere. Um, this is on your cell phone, which is something most people carry around all the time. So I think that's an awesome feature. And also, as Ada mentioned, the fact that it's passive. You don't actually have to press the button. Um, in the event of a heart attack, it will automatically send alerts to your contacts. This is an idea that really resonated with all of us. We all have um, you know, relatives that aren't living with us um, you know, in the house. 
um, who are far away. I know um, my grandfather um, had a stroke and in the backyard, and uh, we, you know, didn't know exactly what was going on, you know, for a while, and I always kind of wonder, you know, what if we'd been able to, you know, find him sooner or whatever. Um, so this is just to kind of, you know, give them that security of having, you know, family members when they need them. In our next story, Andrew Falzone takes us to Rockefeller University, where he spoke with some impressive female doctors who are involved in groundbreaking medical work. Rockefeller University is an institution known for reaching into new frontiers in science. We recently had an opportunity to visit the campus where we found female scientists working on all different types of research. Dr. Anna Pereira is a neurologist who is pursuing critical research in the biology of the aging brain. The goal is to develop treatments that can either slow, stop, or cure this devastating disease. So individuals who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, slowly and progressively, they um, lose those critical abilities that um, are important for their own identities. So in the laboratory, I have been studying uh, those ne the neurons that are most susceptible to dying in Alzheimer's disease. While Dr. Pereira is proud of her work, she doesn't see gender as an obstacle. For me, I, f I see myself as a neuroscientist and a neurologist way above than being a woman scientist or, or woman neurologist. This is Hannah Cohen, she's Hi. a student here. Like most of the more senior researchers at Rockefeller, Dr. Pereira mentors graduate and doctoral students and says it's gratifying to help young scientists of both genders. Great, good job. Thanks, Hannah. Go I deeply believe that every man and every woman um, have a fundamental right to have fulfillment in their personal and professional careers. And I think, I think this is a goal that society, our society, can achieve together. So I'm the physician that works with the group and then we conduct uh, clinical trials testing the activity of these antibodies in people. Dr. Marina Kasky is a medical doctor at Rockefeller University and plays a key role in testing new HIV treatments and vaccines. She administers cutting edge treatments to patients. Because the antibodies activities last for a longer period of time than conventional drugs, they could provide a more convenient uh, regimen either to again, prevent the infection or to treat the infection. That's in contrast to the current regimen of medications that control the disease but need to be taken more frequently. In addition to her work at Rockefeller, Dr. Kasky is a wife and mother of two children and manages to find a work-life balance. This is something that I, um, I try to, to explain to them, that, that if mommy comes home and you already did your homework and you took your shower, we can have fun together instead of uh, in the few hours that we have together. I'm just chasing you to get those things done. And Dr. Kasky also isn't afraid to ask for help and delegate. One way to go about this balance is to try to outsource to others some, some of the house chores so that you can focus your time on your children and not so much in the care of the house. So we did a series of experiments in mice and basically uh, we figure out that this is really important for nicotine addiction. Dr. Inez Ibanez Stallone is a neuroscientist whose research focuses on areas of the brain that control addiction and withdrawal. Using mice with light sensitive neural implants, Dr. Ibanez Stallone's team was able to isolate key cell receptors that control addiction and withdrawal symptoms related to nicotine, marijuana, and opiate painkillers. And when we manipulate this receptor in mice, or so we take it out, or we put it on, or so on, we can see that it really controls the activity of this neuronal tract. So the mice without this receptor, they, they are not sensitive to nicotine anymore, to oxycodone, and also to cannabis. And Dr. Ibanez Stallone hopes more young women will follow in the exciting footsteps of her and her colleagues. I think it's, uh, it's a beautiful profession. When did you discover something is one of the most exhilarating things in life. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You.
Imagine yourself embarking on a great journey without ever leaving home. Professor Jana Levin uses this example to explain how to make science more exciting and inclusive. Megalie Laguerre Wilkinson has more. Jana Levin is the Toe Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Barnard College at Columbia University. She's also the author of Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space, a book about black holes and gravitational waves, a sort of revisiting of an Einstein theory. I became completely enamored of this experiment that was on the horizon, uh, which is called LIGO. LIGO recently detected the collision of two black holes 1.3 billion years ago. Um, and the way that they detected it was because the black holes actually ring space and time around it, like mallets on a drum. The space time vibrates and rings, and those waves, which are called gravitational waves, have been on their way to us ever since. As busy as she is, she's mastered the art, unbeknownst to her, of making science, well, cool. Science just is a part of culture. I think we just have to accept that and stop resisting it so much. So these are the uh, artist studios, mm -hmm. and there are always only three walls, so there, there's a, the fourth wall is always open. When she's not on the Columbia Barnard campus in Upper Manhattan, she's here at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, where she's director of sciences. What's the connection? Pioneer Works, which is um, largely a center for art, and, but also education and research and experimentation. Um, and in its wider view, science fits in very naturally. It really is part of the world now. It's part of the way we experiment with the world. Any child um, experiments with the world is a, intrinsically a naturalist. And we sort of, uh, we kind of beat it out of them a little bit, you know, by trying to make it something academic or scholarly. So Levin likes to remind people that science isn't some scary alien and believes that a common sense approach of explaining is the only way to quell people's fears of science and eventually draw them in. People feel separated from it partly because of the language and the difficulty of entry. I think of it as like climbing Mount Everest and just not everybody's going to do it. It's a really hard climb, but those who get to the top can share what the view has been. You know, they can share what the journey was like. And I think when people feel excluded that they can't make the trip, that can create kind of resentments. When people feel included because, you know, they feel brought along, if only through someone's narrative of their travel log, um, I think the resentment goes away and the curiosity emerges. And it's that curiosity Levin hopes will open more minds to science and create a changed world. And one of the ways she sees this world changing for the better is stepping out of a compartmentalized life we've created for ourselves. Levin wants to be instrumental in creating that. It's a world where the, the walls aren't so severe. Uh, you know, I think we've gotten this confused idea about what we want. I think everyone thinks they want their own plot of land with their front door locked and their, you know, condo or, you know, everything separate. And um, I think it's actually been incredibly harmful um, to people personally and professionally. There, there's been a t complete breakdown of the community, I think. And um, I think the severity of departmental divisions has been really problematic for a lot of people. While this dream won't be realized overnight, you can get a taste of that world at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, where traditional boundaries are broken down and open space is celebrated. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson for Science and You. So this has a, just a very direct application to, uh, to the sheep that are on your farm. Yes, sir. Fantastic. There's only 2,500 registered Cotswolds in the United States, and that includes white and natural colored. Over the years, the people in the Cotswold industry have bred out the natural colors because the fiber artists want just the white wool to dye and use for different things. But now that people have realized there's such a decline in the numbers of natural colors, they're really trying to breed them back and pull them back into the industry. But it's really, really hard to get those high quality natural colored sheep because the genetic gene pool is so low. When you go to look for natural color sheep, it's really difficult to find them. And it's been my passion to breed and bring the natural colors back into the industry. I wanted to be in the fiber industry and have livestock and have the sheep so that I could learn more for myself about the animals in the livestock industry and just take part in that core agriculture process. 
That's our show for today. Join us next month when we investigate the many faces of dementia, the toll that it takes, and potential advancements in treating it. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks for joining us for Science and You.